Welcome to another episode of CNMI Weekly, where we recap the biggest headlines from the past week and share what you need to know heading into the weekend. NMI Senate President Edith Dillian Guerrero said she's been asking for military buildup data for the past two years. And why this is very important is because we have an infusion of capital from a particular industry, which is a military buildup that's happening in Tinian. And what is happening inside the fence and outside the fence we need to be able to quantify the capital infusion to the Marianas. Unfortunately, as we speak today, there is no collection of that particular information. It's just kind of like starting up, trying to gather data from Tinian, trying to gather data from the seaport of what commodities are coming in. The senator spoke at the Saipan Chamber of Commerce meeting this week. She referenced an Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation report showing the millions of dollars in contracts awarded for the military buildup. However, she said, it's not the full picture the CNMI needs. There's no report to quantify how much have we generated as a local government based on these field activities. And this is very critical if we are talking about deficit um, you know, budget, uh, the lack of funding to sustain programs and employment of the public sector. She wants a clearer picture of what the CNMI economy gains from the buildup, including from defense contracts. And so these are, the, these are the concerns or, I guess, conversations, I would say, that would take for the administration to carry on with the uh, federal government, to see where do we fit in in this particular category and how can we, um, again, quantify what can we generate out of this entire activity. Because even for payroll expenses, with holdings, those are not being reported in the Congo. They are reported where the companies domicile. Should we keep the doors of the courts open on Saipan, Tenen, and Rhoda, or should we shut it down? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the answer to that question now is in your hands. That question was posed by the NMI Supreme Court Chief Justice to House lawmakers amid budget hearings on Saipan. The NMI Judiciary requested about $15 million, while the governor proposed $5.3 million amid the fiscal crisis. The budget demands come as demands at the court also mount. 2023 saw the highest number of civil and family court filings in the past five years. These numbers do not account for the numerous pending cases that have been carried over from previous years as well as anticipated jury trial costs and court-appointed attorney costs. These numbers also highlights the Superior Court divisions continuing to remain extremely understaffed. The presiding judge noted that one probation officer in the NMI supervises between 60 to 80 probationers a year. The legislature has just over $100 million to appropriate for the entire Commonwealth. The two branches don't control the fund, so whatever is handed to us is what we have. Um, and then whatever is short is our fault. <laughs> so that, that, that is the stress we get. The Jotun Kizu Public Library was targeted by thieves twice in a matter of months. In April, the library's typhoon shutters were stolen. The library later found it at a recycling center. In June, someone cut the fuel lines and stole gas from their bookmobile and technology mobile express vans. Erlinda Napati is the library director and has worked at JKPL for over three decades. And we've seen minor incidents, you know, but this by far is the worst that I've encountered working here and being the director. Um, I don't know if I should be disappointed or saddened. It's just disheartening that our people uh, are so desperate to attack the library. Their surveillance cameras caught the moments of the June incident, appearing to show a truck picking up a gas container. The Department of Public Safety says they've identified a suspect in the stolen shutters case. The June incident remains under investigation. The library has this message for those responsible. And if these people that are out here um, uh, listening, who, you know, people that did this to the library is out there listening, please come into the library. There are, there are ways that we can help you better your lives. We have free re resume class. We have free resources that you can use. We have free access to the internet where you could probably find 
you know, help or seek help if be it um, mental health challenges or whatever it may be, just needing uh, to, to, to just better your lives. The library is here to help. That's what we're here for. I introduced this, reintroduced this bill in the 19th Youth Congress to really just start start something to preserve, help preserve the culture and also to, because lots of us recognize that there's maybe not dying, but there's a potential that something might happen to our language and our culture. The NMI Youth Congress taking over the House Chamber for their Education Committee meeting. They passed a bill that would require all public schools in the NMI to teach at least one full year of the Chamorro and or Carolinian languages. It will likely pass in their August session and be sent to the House of Representatives for further action. So as a Chamorro individual, I think it's very important that we keep our culture alive, especially for me who isn't as fluent in Chamorro. I think that just makes me want to encourage other students and other people to, to really bring our culture alive. And I'm a Chamorro and Kailinian individual myself, and I think a lot of our traditional practices, especially in the Sinemai, are embedded in, in our language and in our culture. You know, it's who we are. The senators recently discussed their initiative with the Commissioner of Education, Dr. Lawrence Camacho. The Sinemai Public School System told KUAM that they have 40 Chamorro and 16 Carolinian teachers and instructors teaching language and heritage studies across its campuses. Welcome back to another episode of Sinemai Weekly. Now to our one-on-one -on -one interview with a Chamorro and Samoan athlete who's heading to the Paris Olympics to represent American Samoa. Hafede Zantiro, my name is Filomena Leonisa Tapuayalupe Yakopo. I am an athlete from American Samoa. I compete in the 100 meter and 200 meters, and I will be competing in the Olympics located in Paris, France. All right, congratulations. And so tell us a little bit about how you've been preparing and a little bit about your uh, history in the sport because you've been a lifelong athlete, right? Yes, for sure. Um, ever since I was young, I've always dreamt of becoming an Olympian. And throughout my whole life, it has always been instilled to be healthy um, as well with sports. Um, and it took a very long journey to get here. I first started competing um, seriously when I was 16 years old back in 2022 with my first international competition, the Oceania Athletics Championships located in Australia. And then after I competed in the Pacific Mini Games that was held here on Saipan, um, I also competed in the Oceania Cup, the Pacific Games that was last year in Solomon Islands. And I also competed in the World Athletics Championships, indoor championships, uh, located in Glasgow, Scotland. Wow, and so how old are you? I'm 18. Okay, what, what, what makes you want to, uh, you know, compete? Uh, what, what is it about the sport that uh, attracts you to it? Track and field, I really love to say track and field is a lifestyle. Um, I, everything I do is worked around track and field. Um, I love the sport so much because it's an individual sport, so everything that you do, it reflects on your performance, on the hard work that you put in. Um, and there's so much that goes into it, like eating right, making sure that I sleep on time. Um, and it's also very important to be mentally strong. Um, but I'm so thankful that I have a strong support system from my family members, um, you know, my parents, I would not have be I would not be here without their support and everything that they have sacrificed and done for me to get here. Um, you know, just last year my parents flew in my coach. His name is Peter Pulu. He is from Papua New Guinea and he is currently the 100 meter record holder for the Pacific. Um, I was coached by him starting last year, so it's been about two years so far, but. Ever since I was young and until last year, it has always been my dad who trained me. Um, he was the one that did our workouts together, making sure I'm dieting right and I'm fueling my body, um, resting on time. So, 
you know, it's it was always been my me and my dad. So I'm really thankful that my parents were able to provide that opportunity to um, bring me to another level with a professional coach. And you just recently graduated uh, high school, right? Yes. Where did you graduate from and what are you up to now? Um, I graduated from Kagman High School. Um, I graduated top 10, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, I am going to Baylor University. I'm, an, I'm going to be majoring in neuroscience. Right. So you're going to be starting your freshman year? At Baylor University. Next yes, next year. Right. But before then, just the Olympics. <laughs> so, yes. Can you tell me, uh, how did you learn about uh, that you were going to be part of the team? Um, and how did you basically uh, yeah, become part of the team? Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? How did you learn? What did you have to do? So, uh, unfortunately, the CNMI does not have um, an Olympic seat. And... I'm just very blessed that I am not only Chamorro, but I'm also half Samoan. Um, so it was, I was very grateful that I was able to represent American Samoa. And it took a lot to get to where I am today. It is not easy. I had to compete multiple times um, to gain points, to clock in respectable times. Um, so yes, I'm just very blessed and thankful that I received this opportunity to represent my country, American Samoa, in the Olympics. All right, and can you tell us a little bit about what the moment means? I understand there's also some sort of history uh, attached to this, right? Yes, um, so I will be the first Chamorro from the Northern Mariana Islands that will be going to the Olympics, and wow. I, no words can truly describe what that means to me. You know, I have so much pride that I'm not only representing American Samoa, but I am representing the CNMI, the people of the CNMI. And it means everything to me to represent my home, where I'm born and raised from as well. And I'm just extremely blessed and I'm extremely thankful. Right, the Olympics are in a few weeks, but I understand you're, you'll be leaving Ireland soon. Uh, so tell us what the next few weeks look like at, uh, leading up to the actual big day. Yes, so I do leave tomorrow. <laughs> um, I will be um, located in Geneva, France. There will be a training camp there, and I will be competing as well in the local meets just to have a build-up competition to my main one. Um, at the Olympics, so which will be great. I'll be there for a few weeks to continue my training. And then August 2nd will be my race day for the 100 meters. Welcome back to the program. Now we have some Decision 2024 headlines as John Gonzalez is the first to file in the CNMI delegate race. I want to begin by honoring our ancestors, our forefathers, the covenant negotiators, and also our manomku, who we revere uh, to the fabric of our soul. The Northern Marianas has evolved since time immemorial. Our ancestors have owned our islands that we are privileged to inherit from. We had navigators, the proa master navigators without the help of any modern technology since time immemorial. Our ancient indigenous Samoru population and then further complemented by our Carolinian brethren who sailed to distant lands after the decimation of supernatural typhoon in their islands and sailed over and ended up. Uh, and since then, the rest is history. I am here because I celebrate who we are now as a people, diversity. The culture must remain intact, but changes are bound to happen. And that's through God's law. You know, we look back and we thank God for our Lemmai roots, our taro roots. And we are here today and we celebrate everybody 
because this is who we are in a melting pot. Huko Luta, Tinian, Saipan, and the northern islands, Falukafang, our cultural homeland. No matter who you are, what ethnicity you are, as, as long as you live here and we, make, we work here and we live together, we are one Marianas, one Corazon, right? And it is through the heart work of our Manomku, our ancestors, the retired, the retirees, our veterans and our soldiers, our parents, our families before us, that I am so honored and privileged to carry this torch. And so today, upon the first minute of the first day opening of our submission of nominating petitions and candidacy to be your next NMI delegate to the US Congress, I am humbly thrilled to be the first candidate to file as an independent who is beholden to no special interest other than our people's interest. Amen. People Amen. over Amen. politics. Amen. Solutions, Amen. actions, expect results. No more making noises. No more investigations. That, there's a point where that has to stop because our people are suffering, they're still in tents. They're, they don't have water, they don't have power. And by golly geez, let us put aside politics and start identifying solutions and let's uh, unleash actions because Who can you trust as your most respected representative to the US Congress? Who possesses the most sensible character with integrity, fortitude, moral compass, strict ethics, work ethics, and principles to represent you in the US Congress? Who exhibits the best leadership acumen with professional maturity spanning 30 years of work experience and performance record in the legislature, in executive branch, in the federal government, when I interned for the US Congress and I visited the White House a few times over this period, and the nonprofit sector, those that the government is unable to assist, I've been helping our people with my fellow board members, whether it's NMTI Trades Institute, the CHC Volunteers Association, the Northern Moranas Descent Corporation, the PTSA of Kagman, and the entire PAC. Parent Advisory Council, comprising of all presidents of PTAs, Girin Luta, Tinian, Saipan, and private and public schools, and other, other, FESPAC Committee in Culture and stuff. All of those who has exhibited the best performance record. Don't forget the program of CDBGR. And the CDBGS, the CDBGDR, the largest ever federal grant in the Commonwealth history that housing NMHC hired me to write along with the team. And who is best strategically poised and ready to seek effective solutions that directly meets the CNMI's dire economic, social, and infrastructural needs? And who will deploy required actions by competently securing valued diplomatic partnerships and support across all aisles, left or right, Republicans and Democrats and independents? In the US Congress, the White House, and major US federal departments, all of which I have had the privilege and the honor of working with throughout my 30 years in government. And now to more CNMI Decision 2024 news, we sit down with Representative Manny Castro, who's now running for a Saipan Senate seat. Here's more. I did want to ask you uh, what you hope to achieve in the Senate that you couldn't achieve in, in the House. So in the House, it's a really short term, like it's two years. And the disadvantage is that for some of the, the bigger issues, you need time to really get to the bottom of those issues. And within one year, you know, that thing like goes by real fast and then you're back to campaigning. Uh, with the Senate, you'll have more time to really, you have about three years. 
So you have more time to meet with the departments or have the departments meet with you to really look at, hey, is this bill working? There's some bills that, that even my grandfather introduced and it, it became public law and it was never enforced or never implemented, but it was public law. And, you know, that's what the Senate's role is also like to check in on those departments and making sure that they're they're doing what they the law requires them to do um so like one example was the uh, recycling bill the litter problem you know litter might not seem like a big problem but when resources are tight and your your um you know taxing people because there's so much trash to collect so you're taking you know more money from from uh, consumers and you're putting it into uh you know an uh revolving account or uh, appropriating it to a department so that department can go and pick up trash and clean the litter when you can if we implemented that that law that my grandfather introduced it's a recycling act of 1999 it would have reduced the need for excessive taxes and reduce the need for public works and and uh, parks and rec to be going out there and cleaning up a lot of this trash because it it puts the incentive on the people to clean up after themselves just like many states have a five cent uh ten cent redemption even palau the st- you know republic of palau has that so you know, you incentivize people for bringing their their trash back and recycling it rather than taxing them and having a department, you know. I, I really believe in small government and bigger private sector. Um, so, I'm, you know, I know there's more too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, anything else you'd like to add? I mean, when it comes to your platform, is there like one particular issue that is especially so, big for you on this campaign? So these are, I'll just list it out. Um, one is a responsive and organized government. Um, so when you look at a lot of the processing in our agencies, like if you wanted to open up a small business today, you go to zoning. You know, sometimes it can take a few days just to get a cle- uh, inquiry or a clearance. That's one step. Then you have to go, this is a physically like walking, you know, even being in a digital age, we're still doing carbon copy and all these paper processing. We haven't evolved, even though for some agencies, the law requires them to evolve, right? Um, so just just with the business license, there's sometimes I refer people like, hey, apply in Tinian or apply in Rhoda for a business license because you'll it'll happen faster. And we shouldn't it shouldn't be like that. It should be like most places where if you wanted to set up shop here, you can apply online and submit all your documents and boom. But we're talking about policies and procedures that are being uh the response time is so long that um whether it's a federal grant and you get a grant to fix the road or a sidewalk like you have three months and all those permitting stuff hasn't processed so it it delays the construction time now the construction company is scrambling to get the project done because they have to spend the money by a certain deadline and then where does that go with our quality right you're rushing through things so it's there's a ton of uh, issues out there and it all stems with the policies and regulations that we have in place you can watch our full interviews with candidates ahead of the election on our KUAM YouTube channel thanks for tuning in